Now, as part of Women's Month, we'll be exploring various aspects of what the lived experience of women in South Africa is, especially with the shocking numbers of gender-based violence, which has risen uh, immensely during lockdown. We now focus on GBV in the arts of entertainment industry today. More women have been coming out to share their abuse stories in a bid to help other survivors to overcome their silence. We're joined now via Skype by Lerato Moloy, who's a South African model and human rights activist, as well as Vanessa Govender, author and journalist. Thank you to you both, and, and thank you in advance for sharing your experiences. Thank you. Lerato, perhaps let me start with you, because you've recently penned a statement saying that you know it's taken you a while, but uh, you've decided to release a statement uh, to say you're going to you know, embark on the pro proper processes to really formalize this. But what made you decide to speak out? Um, <clears throat> the decision to speak out had been triggered by um, Tejo Faso's um, killing. You know, um, there had been a death at least every day reported of a woman um, and that was I think the the main trigger when um, Tsekho Fatso's um, death was reported. Could no longer keep silent and um, knowing that it could have been me at some point in my life and if I continue to keep quiet um, about the traumas I've experienced, perpetrators and abusers will still get away with murder. Mm. When you say, Lerato, when you say it could have been you, and I know I'm conjuring up a whole lot of uh, memories, perhaps some forgotten. I know that it's still a very painful thing to talk about. But was there a time at some point during uh, your assault that you felt it could have gone as far as you dying as a result of it? Um, with, uh, with regards to that, I've been advised by my attorneys not to, um, to refer to it really at all. Go into detail, yeah, with, with regards to that. Okay, so, uh, so I know you spoke about how you've been treated since you've come out and spoken about what has happened to you, but you spoke about several incidents. What has been the reception? Has it made you feel like you wish you had spoken sooner or you wish you hadn't spoken out at all? Oh, my goodness. Um, it's been an overwhelming amount of support from friends, family, and um, social media friends. And it makes me feel like I could have reported it earlier and at the same time, you know, I cannot live in regret because of, um, you know, how things mm. have turned out. I cannot turn back time and change my, my mm. decision, but I am very grateful for the support okay. that I have from everyone. Vanessa, let's come to you and talk about your experiences, the book that you've written, Beaten But Not Broken. It underscores the fact that, uh, as you say, uh, ultimately what has been experienced by you and your family has been overwhelming support for you speaking out. What were the things that were holding you back from speaking out to begin with? So, firstly, to establish you know, what the experience was like and, and what it was like for me at the time. Uh, I was in my early 20s. I had just started my job as a journalist at the SABC based in Durban as a radio news reporter. I'd gone to a relationship with a radio, uh, a Lotus FM uh, disc jockey. And um, he was my first boyfriend. He was my first intimate partner. And I come from a very conservative community. Um, and very much like the black community, the Indian community is conservative. It is deeply entrenched in, um, you know, the, the in, in patriarchy. So um, I was in a relationship with somebody. I was intimate with this person. Sex out of marriage in my community is something that is deeply frowned upon. 
Um, and here was somebody who was very popular, very well-known, uh, well-liked, um, and he was beating me up, uh, would believe me. Uh, how, how could I possibly tell anybody um, I had gotten myself into this? So I was stuck with it, and I was stuck with him. Um, so, you know, those are, it's, it's, it's the issues of fear and shame. And it's the issues of fear and shame which transcends race, which transcends religion. It is something that every single woman or who has ever been abused feels. Um, so at the time, um, as much as I was, um, you know, in an environment where I, I had access to resources, I had access to people, I consider, and I hate the word outspoken. I speak as much as any other person and any other man. So people say women are with me, but for want of a better word, let's just say I was, I consider myself quite outspoken, but this was a shameful thing. Um, and there was nobody to talk to. I confided in one or two people at the SABC. One, one person had actually walked in to see him uh, with his hand around my throat and pinning me up against the wall. She confronted me and then, you know, I later confided in her. Um, but other than that, at the time, the culture, not just within that corporate environment, but the culture in South Africa was such that these conversations were not being had. The conversation you and I are having right now were never had back then. So to ask you this question, Vanessa, attached. if you'll allow um, me to jump in and ask you, when you say the culture and the environment, I'm curious how much the uh, veneer of what you do, uh, the fact that you're in this world that is considered glam, uh, that, uh, you know, automatically infers that you are empowered. And Ratu, you can talk about this in just a moment. Was that also a hindrance that uh, you don't want to change the perception of somebody who is solid, who can stand on their own and has her, has got it together, so to speak? Uh, I think you've pretty much nailed it um, in the way you've said it. Um, I was a journalist. I am an I am an educated, empowered woman, financially independent. There is an image that you portray. And even years on, after I left the SABC and you know, moved on onto television, um, there is an image. Um, and people come to see, come to expect something. And people hear a concept of who you are, not just as a woman, but as a journalist as well. Who wants to be seen as a victim? Who wants to be seen as somebody who was beaten up, who was punched, who was kicked, who was raped? Who wants to, who wants to be seen as that? So you work very hard to maintain the superficial image that the, that the country sees, right? It's far more appealing, um, you know, um, it's, it's appealing to not just the people that are, are watching you and listening to you. It's, a, it's an appealing concept to yourself because you do not want to see yourself as a victim, it's an ugly thing. Um, you feel unworthy. You feel you feel every negative emotion that comes with it. Um, and you're right. The the entertainment industry creates that um, that facade, you know. And we all of us, including yourself, that's there sitting on TV. We are we are all part of this. We portray a certain something, and what happens behind the scenes, no one will ever know until we take people into our confidence. So the culture of the industry itself breeds, uh, well, firstly, that sort of ab abhorrent behavior where men prey on women. It's your job that's at stake. Um, it's, you know, do you get a good assignment? Do you not get a good assignment if you dare say, you know, um, stand up for yourself or speak out against somebody who's sexually harassing you, that sort of thing. Uh, this culture that we're in, um, and, and and if you look, you know, you do some deep introspection, you yourself will agree with this. That's the culture we're in, the culture of broadcast and entertainment in South Africa. So what is your view of this? Because, I mean, we have seen the emergence of these uh, social media campaigns on, against GBV, sue us all, am I next, tell your story, total shutdown. And I think uh, for many people, there is a, a point of view that it gives women voices. And it's actually almost a contradiction in terms because it, it seems to presuppose that you're given agency. But as you said, in your own experience, people were telling you that if you speak out to you are either endangering someone or you're bringing shame people try to stop you so 
Uh, do they really work in bringing about healing and in bringing about justice, especially for those who've been victimized? <clears throat> in so far as my experience so far, um, <laughs> I, I can actually agree with you. It is contradictory. Every time um, a woman does speak up, there will be a show of support, but the legal system is where the um, re-traumatization occurs, whether it's from um, officials from um, the police or um, the court system. So all of this becomes um, way too heavy for survivors to mm. even fathom getting through because, you know, when you are still mustering up the courage to lay a report of rape. You are met with different opinions and questions. You know, I've been asked uh, by someone, um, what is it that you do to draw this kind of energy towards you, you know? Um, is it somebody that you know or, or is it somebody who knows mm -hmm. what profession you're in? Because you're a model, they assume that you're out yeah. there, you want to draw attention, you're bringing it to yourself. Mm -hmm. It was a colleague um, that I had <clears throat> disclosed um, this particular incident to very recently as well. It was a couple of years back, 2018. And um, even discussing it with friends who, you know, we are having candid conversations about gender-based violence or um, the death of another woman that's been reported and we go into conversation about my traumatic experiences. It would end in conversation where they tell me to just let it go and, um, you know, focus on the positive, just live your life, you know, let it... Um, Get over it. it. Because nothing, yeah, there's nothing that you do um, about it that will change the past or see the person who violated you. Mm. Acknowledge, admit, apologize <laughs> for what they, what they did or even feel ashamed. Mm -hmm. So... And, and Vanessa, I'll come to yeah. you in just a moment, but Lerata, I must ask this, what was going through your mind when you are then uh, thrown into a jail cell and yet all you deigned to do was speak up so that you can be in solidarity with other women who've been through this? Did it make you, you know, realize or think this is why they call it the shadow pandemic, the silent pandemic, because one way or the other women are silenced by the system? Mm -hmm. I I definitely can um, attest to the difficulties of um, you know initially reporting it, especially when you are gaslit by you know police officers who are supposed to you know be helping you in their capacity and whatever excuses. Uh, the police department has at the moment for the way that I was treated at um, Ferenakum police station. <clears throat> it, it, um, it says to me that they really do not care about survivors or victims mm. of gender-based crimes. And um, I, for one, am hoping that us speaking up right now has um, puts a spotlight not just on the thousands of people that have experienced um, violent crimes and attempt to report and get some form of justice. Hmm. But that the government makes an effort to change the, the legal system hmm. and how we are treated as survivors. So, Vanessa, uh, we, we can talk about the, uh, you know, criminal justice system as well, but it's also about the creation of pedagogical and comparative spaces for women to talk about this. I mean, the backlash has been, in some cases, this is toxic feminism. 
um, this is how people have responded to women coming out and speaking about their pain. How do we better that? How do we create uh, that balance? And is there even a need to have a balance? You know, I think when it comes to providing a space and creating an environment for women to speak openly about what they've experienced, if you don't understand this concept of toxic feminism, what is that? So if I were to speak out and say, I am a victim, I am a survivor, this is what happened to me, does that put me into that category? Where people people are, they are not all, some people are uncomfortable with the truth. Abuse and rape are not comfortable subjects, they're not comfortable topics, but we're not here to make people feel comfortable, okay? The truth is never going to make anybody feel comfortable. This is an uncomfortable thing, and I'm sorry. I am very sorry if people feel it's an uncomfortable thing. Um, and I think therein lies the problem. And if you feel it is something you want to label it toxic feminism, um, I must admit this is the, you know, I mean, this concept is, is mind boggling to me. You are very much fundamentally part of the problem not just of this culture, but of this country, you know, where this rot and this evil uh, prevails. There is no such thing as toxic feminism. If speaking out, if standing up, if owning your truth and saying this is what happened to me, that makes you a toxic uh, feminist. Well, hell, you better count me at the top of that list. Uh, we are not here to make anybody comfortable. Um, and more importantly, the, 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 the men, I, I would pretty much assume this concept or this uh, expression was probably, uh, you know, derived by, by a man. Um, these are men who feel comfortable to treat you badly, to speak to you badly, to abuse you, keep you in line, will slap you around. Um, yes, but they are uncomfortable with the truth. Like, we are not here to make anybody comfortable. This is not a comfortable subject. But we will talk about it anyway. And if you don't want to hear, that's too bad. I think the voices of women, not just, you know, in our community and in our country, but I think the voices of women globally, it is, it's overpowering. You can, you can put your hands over your ears. You are never going to block that out. Mm. Um, and the reality is men are killing women. So men let's talk about that women. reality, men Vanessa. Women. And, uh, let's talk about that uh, reality. Uh, technology or digitization is supposed to somehow improve our lives, but it seems that uh, a divide between men and women extends to the digital space as well. How do we have a more gendered approach in, uh, you know, amplifying the voices of women so that their stories are told and heard in such a way that it is purposeful? And I'm not saying purposeful from the storyteller's perspective, but from the, the receiver's end. You see, I think, you know, you, you've got to start like right at the, at the foundation of this problem, which is uh, why are women, why are survivors resorting to technology, resorting to Twitter, mm. resorting to Facebook, resorting to the digital space to tell their stories? Because there isn't a safe space or environment um, around them where they can do this. Not, you know, it's a difficult task with the police. It's an arduous task with the judicial system. We know our judicial system is flawed and fractured. As journalists, we have seen rapists walk free. We have seen killers walk free. We have seen the system work, but we have also seen it fail victims. And, you know, um, you can't even begin to count. Women have no faith there. Nobody's listening. So what do you do? You just throw out your, your truth in the hope that somebody's going to hear. You know, you, you, the question you're asking is very valid. It's very important. But you've got you, you've to tackle the issue from, from the ground up. You know, mm. before you get there, and then ask why are women resorting okay. to this? It's desperation. Mm. And, and Lerato, just as a final question, so if we're to have a parallel process of sorts, because it's been said more than half of, uh, for instance, Facebook and Twitter users who are women have experienced online gender-based violence. So if, while we're fixing the criminal justice system, how do we make sure that uh, it, it also takes with it the digital space so that women don't experience that because we know that, that the owners or administrators of a lot of these platforms have a pretty easy deal. They carry very little responsibility in holding their users to account. So what can we do differently to uh, 
avoid and end the secondary victimization of women? Um, if I were part of um, top management of um, social media platforms, it, it would require, um, I think, a lot more empathy and um, compassion training of sorts. Um, I think just people in general that work for social media platforms. If you are on a level to uh, prevent pain and re-traumatization of victims, you should um, hold it um, a very high to make it easier and safer uh, when cases are reported of abuse online, not just uh, suspensions or, you know, the trolls' accounts, mm. things of that nature, it needs to be uh, at least backed up with some sort of um, assistance with um, getting the survivor, I suppose, uh, justice in whatever form that they could be seeking if they do seek some sort of justice against. Right. Thank you so much to both of you. And I really do appreciate your, you know, reaching out and, and, and making yourselves even vulnerable again to speak about these experiences and, and wishing you both all the best. And I'm sure there are many people who are watching who will provide you with some sort of support, you know, whether on your platforms or just right now. Thank you so much. Lerato Molloy, South African model and human rights activist, and Vanessa Govender, author and journalist.